Happy holidays, everybody. Lewis Moreski here with the last episode of This Week at Enterprise Tech for 2020. What a year it's been. As we've done traditionally, we put together some of the best moments we've had here on Twiat for 2020, and we put it into this year-end best of show. You shouldn't miss it. Twiat on the set. This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you from LastPass Studios. Securing every access point in your company doesn't have to be a challenge. LastPass unifies access and authentication to make securing your employees simple and secure, even when they're working remotely. Check out LastPass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This, this is Twit. twit. This is Twyatt This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 424, airing December 25th, 2020. Best of 2020. This episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by Barracuda. Did you know that 91% of all cyber attacks start with an email? To uncover the threats hiding in your Office 365 account, get a secure and free email threat scan at barracuda.com slash enterprise. Welcome to Twyatt This Week in Enterprise Tech, the show that's dedicated to you, the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and that geek who just wants to know how this world is connected. I'm your host, Louis Maresca, your guide through this big, giant world of the enterprise. Happy holidays from everyone on Twyatt. And what better way to start the holiday by, by, by bringing in the industry experts and my co-hosts and my friends. So I have the very own enterprise and security expert and journalist. He's the editor and senior editor over at Dark Reading, Mr. Curtis Franklin. Curtis, happy holidays, my friend. What's keeping you busy during this uh, holiday season? It's always a pleasure to be here, Lou, especially as we're looking back and seeing the best of what we were doing in 2020. Well, speaking of the best of, we have one of our co-hosts, well, another co-host, Mr. Brian Chi. He's the geek in paradise, and he's going to be trekking across the United States pretty soon. Chibert, welcome back to the show. How are you doing? I'm doing great, and happy holidays to everybody out there. And, you know, hindsight's 2020, and we're going to take a look back at what kinds of really cool things have been happening in the enterprise and remind you of some of the things that you might want to do for the new year. That's right. 2020, what a year it's been. And we've done traditionally put together some of the best moments we've had on Twyatt. And we've put together this year's best of. And that's what's coming up next. And to start the show, we want to throw it over to Curtis to start with our January stores. Well, there's an old, old saying that when the elephants fight, the grass suffers. And we started 2020 looking at what sort of grassy worries companies should have when nation-state actors go to cyber war with one another. Now, cyber risk is on the rise. Curtis, what are businesses to do here? Well, you know, it's interesting. With the uh, recent increase in tension in the Middle East, a lot of uh, tension has been placed on the possibility of Iran having cyber attacks as part of their arsenal against the U.S. And a lot of people have gotten very worried about the possibility of that spilling over into the private sector. Now, when security issues shift in this way, a lot of people get really worried. But the question is, has anything really changed? I talked to a lot of people for an article I wrote in Dark Reading this week, and they uniformly said that the risk today is really no greater than it was two weeks ago. We just have some new attention on new aspects. Mark Testoni is CEO of SAP NS2. Now, that's the large enterprise security division of SAP. And he says that the nation state players are always engaged, always probing in the cyber realm, and always trying to see where they can gain an advantage. He points out that this is much different than the kind of dynamics that we saw when he and I, for that matter, were young, where the Cold War was playing out primarily on the physical battlegrounds and in the diplomatic era. Now, Another person 
Peter Carraro, who is cyber governance manager at a company called Varsla, said that two weeks ago he might have said that the biggest immediate threat came from criminal organizations, and they're fairly dependable. They have a very straightforward goal. They want to extract data or behavior from a company that they can convert to money. The nation-state sponsored attacks are going to have very specific, perhaps not financially focused goals, but they're going to differ depending upon the exact nation that we're talking about. And some people have told us what these are. For example, China is known to be after intellectual property. They've had long and very successful campaigns at stealing intellectual property from American companies. Now, some of that is defense-related. Some of it is simply economic-related. Other companies or other countries look for cash. North Korea is primarily noted for this. Why? Because sanctions make it difficult for them to get hard Western cash. Therefore, they have tended to have a lot of different campaigns that have gotten cash out of Western financial institutions. We know and have seen a lot of reports about Russia being interested in political aims and in aims that deal with providing information or disinformation, as some would have it, to American and other Western audiences. Iran, Iran has always had two or three different things that they were doing. One is to find out about their critics. They have a known lengthy set of campaigns that have gone against, say, the travel industry, trying to figure out where individuals were traveling, where they're staying, how they're moving, where they're going to be. They're also known for throwing what I would characterize as chaos bombs, things that just cause confusion and chaos. And they're awfully darn good at it. <clears throat> now, one of the people that I talked to uh, Sergio Caltagirone, who's vice president of threat intelligence at Dragos, pointed out that industrial targets are also vulnerable and that these can be very easy ways into an organization. Jason Kent, the hacker in residence at Sequence Security, pointed out that all it takes is one or two unpatched systems on a shop floor to open up an entire network to attack. So, so what are companies supposed to do about this? Everyone that I talked to pointed out the importance of something that our very own Brian Chi has talked about to over and over again, and that's defense in depth, layers of security. Some people refer to it as the Swiss cheese model of security. That's where you know that in any given layer, there may be a hole, but the holes don't all line up. And with any luck, if you have enough layers, none of the holes go all the way through. Mark Testoni, I mentioned him at SAP NS2. He said that those layers should include culture. Cybersecurity is cultural, he says, and it needs to be recognized that technologies are tools in the battle but they aren't themselves the battle. And he pointed out the critical importance of taking this all the way to the executive boardroom and the C-suite. As a matter of fact, he said that he can imagine a day when companies are evaluated by regulators and the market on their cybersecurity and resilience in the same way that today they're evaluated on their financial statements. So, the good news is that all of these challenges can be opportunities. Mark Testoni said, I think we have to evolve the debate from whether we do cyber in organizations to how we can create value from it. And that may be the toughest part. Looking at the international discord and confusion as a real opportunity for companies to find new ways to bring value to their position in the market. So I, I want to turn to to my co-host now. Lou, I know that you are part of a commercial organization 
So as a manager there, how much attention do you pay to it when the possibility of nation state cybersecurity activity is in the news? Is, is that something that's really on your radar screen at all? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that large organizations, especially like Microsoft and others, are always looking for this data that's going to reveal um, any type of campaign, not only against nation states, but also against businesses. Um, companies like Google, Microsoft, Facebook, they're, they are large targets and they just know that eventually things will come uh, and they have to be ready. Uh, and so by looking for these, these, these signs um, definitely help. Um, but the, the problem here is a lot of times they're not always going to find the signs. And so um, they have to be ready from another point of view, which is why they have organizations. These large businesses have organizations that actually continue to almost pen test and, and verify fuzz test environments and, and different software to make sure that they can know about the vulnerabilities before they're exploited and before they're used by other campaigns, um, uh, ex, you know, both in the global uh, arena and the local arena. Um, and, and so a lot of, they're spending a lot of money to do so. And I can tell you it does help, but it's not going to get everything. And that's kind of where paying attention to the signals will really help. Well, Brian, we Lou talked about paying attention to the signals and, and things of that nature, but you have seen an awful lot of nation-state activity in your career. Realistically, we, we can say soothing words to private enterprise security professionals, but is there anything they can realistically do to protect themselves against a, a nation-state-sponsored attack? Personally, I think it's going to take an awful lot of education. That's that's really the bottom line. So what I tell a lot of my students, what I tell a lot of the people I brief is that the really huge difference between the guys that are trying to grab your money and the nation states that are trying to grab your knowledge is patience. So there's a thing we say. Um, we a lot of people in the security industry consider China as being the number one threat. And they have patience. They are willing to collect grains of sand. You do that long enough and you have your own beach. Just look at what's happened on, gee, a lot of those new fancy fighter jets and bombers and ships and so forth look an awful lot like product produced in the United States. We need to educate people. We need to make sure that everybody understands this whole concept of collecting grains of sand. We need to be able to go and say, hey, um, I'm not willing to walk away from my laptop unless it's locked. I'm willing to make sure that I'm using current SSL certificates. I need to be willing to make sure that I'm changing passwords on a regular basis. And I think in truly, the, this is going to be something that needs to be started in the K-12 through arena. We need to train our children. We need to get them used to this. Personally, I think, you know, this is something I say to Lou, being um, someone that works for a company that work, builds operating systems, is we are long past the point where we actually need to start having something we know and something we have. We need multi-factor authentication. We need it now. Uh, we need to stop making compromises. Password vaults are a big deal. K-12 through should have password vaults. We need to make this part of our culture and slow these people down. I love the idea of beginning the process of, of security awareness in K through 12, and even even beginning to up the security practices. Well, well, Lou, I, I want to come to you with one last question. A lot of companies really feel they have two options when it comes to security. One is defending themselves against attacks that take place, and the other is reducing their profile out on the internet. In other words, reducing their visibility. Now, I hate the idea of security through obscurity. I think it doesn't work. But which do you like better, the idea of trying to reduce your attack surface on the internet or to defend against the attacks that you know are going to come against you regardless of what that profile might be? 
You know, actually, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, there's a lot of times where organizations will have endpoints and nodes that are exposed to the internet that they don't necessarily always use. Uh, plus, consolidating down to single points of entry allows you better sometimes to actually monitor and secure those endpoints. Uh, so having these kind of single points of entry that you can essentially monitor and verify and continue and, you know, and, and put, you know, bots and AI and, and all this types of stuff um, on it will allow you to have a better handle of what's going on. So like a lot of services out there, you know, I know that Facebook likes to stand up new services and, and so does Google. And a lot of times, sometimes these services, they don't play out. Sometimes they're in for internal purposes and they they don't necessarily pull them down over time uh, or, you know, sunset them. And so I think that by reducing that surface area, by sunsetting them when you're not using them or even by saying, hey, we are using them and now they're becoming mainstream. Let's consolidate this down to a single service or let's move it closer to the metal or let's kind of route it through a single point of entry. They tend to kind of leave it out there and they feel it sometimes it's for performance reasons. Sometimes it's just because, it's, you know, built on different infrastructure or whatnot. And so they leave it out there and that just leaves them exposed to another point of entry that that is is used for for cyber terrorism and cyber threats. So I think, yeah, I think it's a little bit of both. I think you can't do one without the other. Um, and you know, you by reducing your service area, you can make it a little slightly easier for you to monitor and verify things. But in the same sense, uh, you know, the problem still exists whether you leave them out there or not. So I think it, it, you're going to have to put money and effort on both sides of things for sure. Ransomware attacks are targeting oil and gas operations on the OT side. The Industrial Control System, or ICS, sector has become one of the latest favorite targets of ransomware attacks. As proof, the head of an operational technology, or OT, cybersecurity services firm, says at least five organizations in the oil and gas industry were recently hit by RIUC. And the attacks don't stop there. Researchers believe the ransomware attack revealed late last month by the U.S. Coast Guard in a Marine Safety Information Bulletin may have been part of a more widespread RIUC ransomware attack. Now, the tactics, techniques, and procedures used against all five oil and gas victims were similar, indicating that the RIUC attackers were specifically targeting the sector, possibly in a coordinated campaign. Ryuk is a ransomware variant created by a Russian cybercrime group known as Wizard Spider and is well known for targeting large companies and organizations with the aim of scoring lucrative ransomware payments. As of the third quarter of 2019, the average initial ransom demand from Ryuk attacks was over $375,000. Now, security rex experts recommend that OT using and other organizations maintain clean copies of their systems, which seems mighty good advice since researchers say that the attacks against OT targets will almost certainly increase in 2020. I think the next story here that we have for the Bytes is actually a fun one, and it's a more informative one uh, around cybersecurity. Because you know, when I saw the rise of Skywalker, I'll tell you one thing: it, I learned a lot about the Star Wars canon and all of the storylines that go along with it. But I guess there was also a lesson in cybersecurity there too, as well. I'm going to throw it to you, Kurt. What's going on here? Well, as we all know, the various films in the Star Wars franchise have had many lessons on many levels to teach us. And as it turns out, someone has indeed found cybersecurity lessons on the screen from The Rise of Skywalker. Now, I before I get started, I'm going to say I'm one of those people. I actually liked The Rise of Skywalker, but then again, I started watching the Star Wars franchise the first week the first film was released. In 1977, it happened to be the first film my now wife and I saw together. So I, I like the franchise. I like this film. And that was before I knew about the security lessons. It's clear in this film that the Empire has unlimited funding, just like most cybersecurity experts. And the rebels, because of that, perhaps managed to sneak in and out of Imperial facilities in every film with light speed effortlessness. Now, the Empire clearly has the best security in the galaxy, 
and yet they're unable to keep a seven foot six Wookiee and his rowdy cohorts from grabbing whatever assets they'd like time after time after time. It's really no surprising that Darth Vader had anger management issues. Now, each Star Wars film has been influenced by the time and events during which it was developed, and the cybersecurity lessons learned in Star Wars, The Rise of Skywalker, are especially relevant to issues we face today with things like biometrics, secure data management, and human error with passwords. Now, let's get started. First lesson is betrayal from the inside. Very early in this film, we learn that the First Order has a spy in its midst, supplying the rebellion with valuable information. We find out ultimately, and spoiler alert, if you haven't seen it and don't want to know about it, hit the mute button now. We find out that General Hux, who is a top member of the First Order's leadership, who bypasses the lockdown procedures and allows the heroes to make their escape, sounds like a lot of C-level executives I've dealt with. Because security protocols are only as good as the individuals who run them. And even the most hardened security uh, security can crumble when the bad actor comes from the inside. Something that IBM found that happens in six out of 10 security attacks. And of those, 25% were carried out by inadvertent actors. In other words, never ascribe to malice what can logically be ascribed to clumsiness and just plain lack of thinking. Something else that we dealt with was biometrics, which turned out to be a two-sided First Order coin. How did their, uh, our heroes manage to sneak aboard the First Order ship? With a First Order officer's medallion, which was conveniently provided by a scoundrel. Now, this medallion makes any spacecraft appear as if it's being operated by an officer in the First Order, and therefore lets them through, well, pretty much great and deadly security. Now, uh, if someone is able to gain access to the biometric token that we're using in multi-factor authentication, it's the same thing. Your phone is your first order officer's medallion for your social media, your bank account, and any number of other things that you have very securely protected with multi-factor authentication. Uh, one of the problems, of course, is if your biometric data is stolen, you can't just change your body around. The technology to give us new fingerprints is expensive and painful. And because these biometrics are stored in the cloud and use local hardware access, you need to be careful because having the cloud exposed, losing your physical device could expose these to, well, just about anything. What's the next lesson? It's that we need to limit potential gains from attack. In order to gain uh, valuable information about the Sith Temple, C-3PO had to decode Sith runes found on a stolen knife. But there were protections in place saying that this couldn't happen. Now, a hacker was able to get into the forbidden memories, wiped C-3PO's memory, and restored the bot to his factory fresh settings. So, we know that the iPhone and a lot of other smart devices use something similar. If things, if there are too many attempts to get in, if there are certain types of illegal operations, they reset to factory fresh. Or they brick and must be reset in order to become usable again. So this is an example of security companies who have to go farther to design systems that reduce the value of the data lost in any attack. Using a unique password for every account, for example, would mean that if a hacker gets access to one of your accounts, they have access to one of your accounts, not all of your accounts. Limit the payoff, and it means that you become less the low-hanging fruit. And finally, winning the rebellion, keeping the bad guys at bay, is never a one-and-done operation. When new security is implemented, bad actors 
will consistently and inevitably contrive new ways to counteract it. But the rebellion that you, the good guys, never gives up. Make sure there are no spies in your midst. Don't rely on cloud-based biometrics and reduce the potential payoff from an attack. Star Wars has always shown us the consequences of even the smallest breach. Paying attention to the details will keep your galaxy safe and not just a long, long time ago. Okay, Lou, I'm, I'm, I'm going to turn to you. You hang out with technical folks all the time. How often do you hear technical professionals talk about issues in their work, issues in their career in terms of something they've seen in a movie or on a television program? Yeah, first of all, I love this. This is amazing. But uh, second, I, I do people relate to this all the time. I and mean, you need to talk about um, even some of the latest movies that are out there, a lot of the social engineering techniques to get into networks, to get into machines, uh, you know, to kind of first breach um, is, you know, definitely something that people relate to a lot uh, because a lot of these writers figure out, hey, what are the the latest ways people are actually breaching and that work really well, on a, which are really hard to block. And so there, a lot of times people do relate this type of stuff. Um, even some of the communication styles that we use today uh, you know, whether it's messaging or it's voice activation, um, a lot of the AI uh, ideas actually come from, you know, movies. And I think they relate back to, wow, wouldn't that be cool if we could actually do that kind of thing? Um, also, you know, around security as well, this is very similar as you you can. They kind of relate back to, well, remember in the movie uh, they were able to do X, Y and Z. Well, again, this could be possible if we don't, uh, you know, put this type of security block on or if we put the system in place. So again, you know, relations to these types of things, obviously current events apply and, and most companies take note to these types of things um, because a lot of these companies spend millions of dollars doing the research uh, to figure out what's the current events uh, to help them be more applicable to their movie uh, scripts. Uh, and so, of course, companies will pay attention. Uh, so I would say, you know, there are a lot of learnings and a lot of movies that are coming uh, and that are already out there. Uh, but again, the same thing goes to hey, you know what? You always got to be ahead of the curve as well. So start looking into security a little bit more and paying more attention. Well, folks, it's time for the bites. Now, we've heard COVID-19 is reaching all ends of the earth, right? Well, it's having effects on hardware shortages as well. And Chibert is going to go take us through all that. Chibert? Okay, so this story is borrowed from Ars Technica. And they're saying a couple of weeks ago, IPC, a trade group that represents electronic companies, surveyed manufacturers to estimate the impact of the coronavirus epidemic on the industry. Manufacturers surveyed said their suppliers have warned them that they should expect about three weeks of delays on average. But manufacturers expect things to get even worse than that, about five weeks on average. And select few have actually said expect delays longer than nine weeks. Well, some of the interesting things that have been happening is like, for instance, here, I'm going to read some of the comments from the people that have been polled. My workplace had an order of Lenovo laptop for customers come in without the WLAN adapters installed. Lenovo has advised us that the lead time for the parts to come in is in the three to six month region. For the time being, they requested that we purchase off-the-shelf USB wireless dongles and they will reimburse them for the cost and install them for the customer until such time that they are able to provide the parts and installation services. So there's all kinds of things that are happening. And, you know, we can go on and on and on, but COVID-19 is really and truly unprecedented. We've never had something quite like this. We've never had a pandemic in modern history. You know, obviously we've had the plague and the Black Death and things like that. But for the first time, we've had the ability to be able to tell people, stay home. Well, staying at home is a double-edged sword. A lot of a lot of work at home people, maybe they don't have enough equipment. Maybe they don't have a good firewall. Maybe they don't have this or that. So <clears throat> I'm going to say traditional companies, are they even ready to tell their people to work from home? We've, we've already heard comments from Kurt and Lou about part-time workers are getting, they're not getting a good shake on this one. So I'm going to ask Lou. You and Microsoft 
have all been asked to stay and work from home. What are some of the ramifications that have been happening? You already mentioned one, that you now have to get into the habit of scheduling break times because now everybody's doing, you know, my, in the, obviously Microsoft Teams meetings, one right after another after another. What other kinds of things are happening to you and what are the ramifications? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, you know, when you're at when you're in a building in a, a large company, a lot of times the conference rooms are held up uh, by other meetings, and so it's a natural way of separation where you can kind of separate or span out different meetings over time. So for instance, if I want to do a meeting in an hour from now, the conference is not available, so I have to schedule maybe another day. And so there's like this natural separation. It gives me kind of some time to actually focus on things. But now I'm that I'm working from home, I'm literally sitting in this chair right here eight hours a day. Um, there's no need to get up and go to a conference room. And there's usually unlimited availability here because somebody could just make a, a Teams meeting, online meeting, whatnot. Uh, and I just have to go and, and, and join it because most of the time there's other people that have that time available too. So I'm actually finding that I'm not getting up very much. Uh, <laughs> and it's interesting. So I'm like you said, I'm having to schedule some break times in between. I'm having to have them push it out uh, so I can go out for a walk or or get some a snack or so on. So I'm actually seeing that as a unintended consequence of where I'm working remotely. But there's other things too, like for instance, um, a need for a very viable and strong and reliable connection. I mean, there are times where I'm having one-on-ones or even team meetings and you know my connection is very kind of up and down. Now I have a business connection um, and it's supposed to be fairly reliable, but when the backbones and the different nodes in the area are overwhelmed, it doesn't matter if you have business or not, um, they're going to have trouble. So that's another thing that I'm actually seeing as a unintended consequence. Everyone working from home is putting a lot of stress on on the network. Uh, and the last thing is hardware. Um, a lot of people now, obviously, people from our company um, have the hardware to take home. And uh, in fact, Microsoft's been really great and gracious about, hey, what can you take home? And um, if we need to get you extra, that kind of thing. But some organizations, they don't have that luxury. Some education doesn't have that luxury. Um, and so working from home or learning from home is sometimes tougher because you just don't have the resources to be able to do it. And you don't want to go to a library or some other place to be able to get internet because then it just violates the whole thing of working from home. So I think there's a lot of interesting unintended consequences from having to stay at home because sometimes there are some barriers that you have to get over for sure. Cool. Hey, well, let's go ask Curtis. Your magazine is mostly folks working from home or working remotely. Has there been any change for you in the magazine area? Well, for our magazine, for dark reading, there's been no change at all because we are a completely virtual team. No, no one on the, on the dark reading team uh, habitually goes into an office. We're all working from, from homes. And I'll be honest, I've been working from a home office with one uh, relatively brief two-year exception uh, since 1991. It's become a lot easier, but it is something that you know can be done. When it comes to things like internet access, you uh, come up with some alternatives. I, for example, uh, have a MiFi, uh, which is something that was uh, I, I saw the benefits of because of our very own Chebert. Uh, I also know where the coffee shops and other places with good, reliable internet connections are in my my area, and we also have a. Uh, fine public library here in Orlando that has a good solid connection. So there are, there are options that you learn. There are also things you do to stay productive and be a part of a team. Uh, Lou, I'm going to suggest that you try setting an alarm once an hour. Uh, get up. What's my alarm? I have to go refill this thing uh, to, to keep me well caffeinated uh, and the coffee machines on the other end of the house. So you learn small tricks. You become uh, more productive through the use of technology, but there really is a great deal of acculturation that has to take place. You know, in our case at Dark Reading, uh, we're used to, to gathering in virtual teams, ones, twos, up to the full team on a fairly regular basis. For the rest of my company, uh, the larger company, Informa, which is the world's largest event producer, uh, in many places, there are profound changes. There are some countries where working from a home office is practically unheard of. 
And there are some teams that just find it very difficult to do the sort of coordination they must do for a large event if they're not all in the same place. So it is a case-by-case, team-by-team thing. But most companies should be aware that if the work process will allow, the technology is, in fact, there to, to let people work from home and remain productive. Well, you know, speaking of specialized things, sometimes your corporation, either because it's personally identifiable information, you know, intellectual property, whatever, you really don't want that specialized information leaving and going into what could be a, a less well-secured network of a home office. So I've been a big, big fan of virtual desktop infrastructure. <laughs> and, um, you know, Lou is in our back channel talking about this thing he's got called a VDI jump box. Lou, tell us about it. Yeah, so the interesting thing is a lot of times remote desktop, um, you have to a specific gateway they connect to, and then you have to route through the gateway, and it's not as scalable as using a VDI-type technology. Uh, I think it's called Windows Virtual Desktop, um, and we can use a, a WVD uh, to actually use it as a jump box to then connect remotely to remote desktop services, and so then that doesn't make the uh, need for the gateway there. Uh, and the interesting thing is it uh, allows us to scale out a lot more, um, and the performance is, is actually fairly responsive. And so um, I'm seeing not only us, but a lot of organizations are using this type of technology um, to support that um, kind of scale-out feature. Now, you can scale out uh, RDP gateways as well. Um, it's definitely capable. Um, but this is a sometimes an interesting way to secure the channel as well um, because of you might have some normal channels that you have in the browser where you do, do MFA or different types of authentication, and it's supported already through your browser. Uh, and so you want to support that for um, doing remote de desktop as well um, or remoting in. So this is a way to do that. And the interesting thing is a lot of organizations are starting to do that to ensure that they can scale out a lot faster. Um, and um, they they just don't have to worry about the security because it's already in place. Super cool. Well, you know what? I think one of the side effects of this whole pandemic is the IT industry is going to start coming up with some really clever ways of making the work at home movement work. Well, when we come back, we have more of the best of. But before we do, we have to thank a great sponsor of this week in Enterprise Tech, and that is Barracuda. Now, Barracuda is the provider of cloud-enabled enterprise-grade security solutions that protect your email networks, data, and applications. Suddenly, you have dozens, hundreds, or maybe thousands of employees working remotely, each one of them getting tons of emails each and every day and making them vulnerable. Now, 91% of all cyber attacks Start in an email, whether they're spear phishing, ransomware, account takeover, conversation hijacking. Multiply that by how many employees times how many emails. One click on the wrong email can cost you money, customers, and even your reputation. Now, Barracuda researchers have seen a steady increase in the number of coronavirus-related spear phishing attacks since January. And they've observed a recent spike of 667% in this type of attack since the end of February. Now, get protection you need for your company with Barracuda total email protection. It includes all-in-one email security backup and archiving, AI-based protection for spear phishing, account takeover, and business email compromise, an automated incident response that gives you options to quickly and efficiently address attacks, and security awareness training to actually educate your workforce so your employees can be the first in line of defense against the attacks. Now, right now, there are new attacks impersonating organizations like the World Health Organization, and attackers actually utilize domain spoofing, and they promise information related to things like the coronavirus in an attempt to trick users like you into phishing scams. Now, ensure safety and security of your business with Barracuda. To uncover the threats hiding in your inbox, get a secure, free email threat scan of your Office 365 account, risk-free, at barracuda.com slash enterprise. That's Barracuda dot com slash enterprise barracuda your journey secured and we thank barracuda for their support of this week in enterprise tech now back the best of well 2020 had all kinds of interesting things and one of our big episodes was talking about remote access what are the issues at the c-suite 
what are the issues in the technology, and what kinds of vulnerabilities does remote access put you into, and what are the things you might want to take a really hard look at to protect yourself from the bad guy. I think we have another really great set of topics here, especially around security. Um, and when, you know, on your network, you want to be able to detect things that are going awry, especially in the remote working force, especially anomalies. Kurt? You know, we're, we're at a point where in our business world, we log into work in the morning, usually, oh, between 9 and 9.15. We log into mail. Uh, log into uh, our collaboration system, whatever it may be, uh, then log into our various business applications. Place we log in from physically and based on our IP address, the time we start work, the sequence of logins, all of those form a unique pattern. And any unique pattern can be useful as an authentication factor or an indicator of normal or abnormal activity. Right now, there's a problem, though. With millions of people around the world sent out of the office to work from home, how do you establish what is a normal behavior in an absolutely abnormal time? The issues around the behavior-based authentication that has become bigger and bigger and bigger echo larger IT behavior issues of the moment. Daniel Norman, who's research analyst at the Information Security Forum, says, quote, during times of crisis, behavior can be overwhelmed by stress and especially by disruption to daily routines. The COVID-19 lockdown has demonstrated the requirements for organizations to manage behavior effectively or face disruption from a growing range of security threats from both outside and within the business. Now, one of the things that is very true is that whether we're in an abnormal time or not, benchmarking using behavior has to begin with an understanding of which behaviors are useful for indicating a user's identity. Now, one researcher Robert Capps, who's vice president at New Data Security, say, says that users who are sheltering in place will have some or all of the same characteristics present in their interactions that they did pre-COVID. They'll continue to use their home internet connections, continue to use their existing devices, and will use those devices in generally the same way as before. He pointed out that the habits and patterns can actually decrease the friction in a user's computing experience allowing them to open and use some applications without stopping to think deeply about the user experience. And it is that automatic nature of the actions, the not having to stop and think about it every time that makes those actions useful from an authentication perspective. Um, now, while we tend to think that for many of us, what we're going through at work now is completely out of the ordinary. Some researchers say that it might be more regular than normal. Jason Kent, who's hacker in residence at Sequence Security, says, I would imagine that today's behaviors are less anomalous than usual because on a normal day, people log into or visit sites from networks at work, on the train, at Starbucks, at the airport, and at home. Today, their one and only login is coming from home. Now, most organizations understand that as they develop these markers, they have to understand what is going on with remote workers, both normally and now. And it is very, very complex. Uh, one researcher says, while behavior-based analysis for authentication and threat detection is necessary, it's anything but simple. It is, in fact, fraught with complexity and may lack key context for making effective decision. Think about networking behavior analytics as being able to understand the travel patterns of commuters 
but not understand what they do before, after, and during those commutes. So anomaly detection, whether we're talking about using it as a bit of authentication or for detecting malware and malicious activity, is difficult. But it can become impossible if you don't have a baseline. And getting a solid baseline is critical before you go into times of unusual activity. Um, one researcher, though, says that our algorithms have gotten far more sophisticated than we typically give them credit for being. He said, anyone tossing behavior-based detections out the window due to the shift in work habits doesn't really get behavior-based detection in the first place. While we did see a temporary decrease in the effectiveness of network-based behavior detections against authentication gateways when all of the work at home started, the algorithms recovered within 48 hours. That is, I think we all would agree, much faster than the general business systems recovered. So I'm going to turn to my co-host, Lou. I'm going to ask you first, I mean, of the three of us here at Twyat today, you're the one who has seen your work routine change the most. So on a scale of one to 10, where would you put the, the change in terms of the degree of change that you've been seeing? You know, remote work is, is difficult for everybody. Um, and I think no matter how many technologies or how many times you try to prepare, um, you're never going to be fully prepared for everything. And I think the degree of change is definitely in a high, I would say probably a 70, 80 percent degree of change, even though a lot of people have tried, um, you know, in, uh, intermittently throughout the year to work remotely or to re work from home. I still think there's a lot of change there and it calls for a very difficult set of patterns to be able to detect, especially from anomaly detection uh, perspective and security perspective. Um, because again, establishing a baseline is important and you kind of have to wait to see what that baseline is before you can start, um, you know, detecting variances from that baseline. So like training these models and, and determining what you're seeing is a very difficult thing for a system to do. And I think with the kind of 60, 70, maybe even up to 80% change in in workforce, uh, you know, characteristics, it's going to be difficult. And I think, you know, a lot of organizations are, you know, still trying to catch up um, and, and to keep up with the market and, and what's going on. So I think, you know, you're going to see, we're going to start to see a lot more um, things come out in the woodwork uh, about maybe even exploitations of uh, of these because because again organizations can't keep up. Well, Lou, I, I think you're right about keeping up. Brian, I want to turn to you and ask the question: If you need to get this baseline, if that's so critical, do you have to wait until things are absolutely running smoothly and normally before you can start? developing the baselines? I mean, isn't that asking a lot of an organization when we really nev never know when some sort of event is going to happen that is abnormal? Yeah, it's it's really hard when you start you know, talking about the big picture. But what I do is I, I kind of flip that coin around. I actually go and focus in. If I'm trying to do an entire organization, that's almost an impossible task. You know, it's too big. It's too much to chew at once. But if I go and concentrate on, you know, one or one division, one department, one set of people at a time, <clears throat> it starts getting easier. You know, it's a it's a smaller bite. So like for instance, what what I've actually done with a couple of my clients is I said, I don't know what's going to happen. You know, life is life is always changing. We might have a pandemic. I actually use that in, in a pitch. Uh, we might have a war. We might have something <clears throat> that's going to radically change um, how you do things on a normal basis. And I try and protect my clients against that. So what I've done, especially with doctors and lawyers that are my clients, I go and, you know, we say, I'm going to zone off your work from the kids and the wife. 
or the, you know the spouse. Let's use the spouse as more politically correct. And so, like for doctors, I will have them do their work, their especially their clinical notes and things like that, on a completely separate network from the kids. Because <clears throat> there's no guarantee that the kid's not going to bring a laptop home and have viruses and malware and spyware and all that kind of good things. So I plan for it. Even though it's a normal day, we're still zoning them off. <clears throat> One of the other things I do if the um, person wants to move around is even some of the simple ER firewalls are capable of doing VLANs. Even VLAN tags over Wi-Fi are very doable. So I, I will actually set up profiles, you know, a new network where it's they get their they get their configuration over a VLAN so that they're separated. So I start I've started getting in and trying to get these people into the habit so that they've already started separating their work from from their personal life um, in an attempt to make it so that the profiling systems that the corporation uses aren't going to get thrown for a loop if something big happens like a pandemic. I think that uh, that the, the that this may this I, I I know this has been an overused phrase recently, but our new reality. I think that uh, when I first started working from home in 2004, I worked for a company who literally made the technology that enabled people to work from home. And there was a huge mindset at the the top level, the e staff level, that unless you were in the office and we could see you, you weren't actually working. And this was a big thing to overcome. I think that this is going to be one of those things where we have ha have to evolve very quickly and solve the problems on the other end. And I also agree 100% with BAM is that, that we have increased our attack vector um, enormously with that. Um, and I just would really like to remind you guys that of all of us, BAM probably has the most secure home network because he lives, eats, and breathes that. I, I know I have bad habits, even though I know better. The average person who's coming home to do their average office work at home um, is going to look at that home router and wonder if it's even possible. Not only what is a VPN, but can you even VPN separately off? Um, you know, all of the devices that are all of a sudden now have access are an attack vector into a corporate network. Um, how many thousands of IoT devices with Mirai possibly on them? Um, are, are now have a basically a side channel attack vector into a corporate network. Right, right. Yeah, Just I think to it makes sense. You I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I can honestly say, I, you know, I'm not always as careful as I maybe should be. And I think one of the things, big things, is a lot of organizations nowadays are starting to lock down data and data access to the point where you can't even access it unless you're over VPN. I'm starting to see that in the wild. Um, and even then, um, they want you using devices that have been registered um, and they know that you're not using them for personal use and that kind of thing. So I, I think that these types of steps are going to be need to be done by organizations in the current climate, especially when people are, you know, shifting between their, you know, their their normal devices at home, their, you know, play devices versus their work devices. And sometimes that line gets blurred. Um, and, and these types of things need to be taken covered. So we'll see what happens. We'll definitely see how it evolves over time. Well, folks, that does it for the bites. And this is now my favorite part of the show because we get to bring in a guest to drop some knowledge on the Twilight Riot. And today we have a really great guest, Chris Quinn, CEO of Log DNA, And he's going to take us through what's going on in modern and modernizing log management. Really excited for him to be here. Chris, thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me. This is super exciting to have, especially during these times in this climate. Yeah. Now, I'm really excited to have guests on that I really revere their work, their company. LogDNA is like one of my favorite companies because they have some really great features. They're really focused on developers and DevOps. Yeah. Now, before we get into all of that, though, our audience loves, loves, loves to hear origin <laughs> stories and people's yeah. kind of journey through tech. Can you maybe take us through a quick journey through tech and how you ended up at LogDNA? Absolutely. So um, this is actually my third time, third co-founder opportunity with the same co-founders. So we started three companies. Uh, we met in class for freshman year of college in computer science and dot uh, in dot net class. And uh, as our journey nice. progressed, we, we you know built and sold our first company, second company. Uh, we learned a lot. And the third one, we got the opportunity to move to uh, to California and to participate in uh, in this accelerator Y Combinator. 
And uh, we, we had an original idea, but only to realize we built this internal logging system that was way more powerful than, uh, than uh, what we originally thought. So uh, we decided to spit it out. And um, a lot of the, the functionality that we wish we had as developers is you know, ease of use, um, super fast search speed, but also like Kubernetes. We're big on Kubernetes and we saw a lot of gaps in that, in that area. And uh, that was the origin of LogDNA four years later. Um, we, we work with thousands of customers or team size of almost 100, and uh, it's been an amazing journey. But the best part is we're literally just getting started on where we could take this observability space. So this this kind of hits close home for me because LogDNA focuses on developers and what they need to be mm -hmm. kind of successful and scale at their work. Can you maybe take us through the essence of LogDNA? Absolutely. So we empower developers. We empower them to uh, be able to aggregate all their logs be able to monitor it, be able to get an alert from it, be able to debug off of it. And in, in essence, it's to be able to tell developers what happened in the past, what's what's happening right now, but what's about to happen, and alert you accordingly. So uh, it's kind of like mission controls to, to analyze your servers and application. It's nice that you come from that from the engineering background, so you understand like you need, this is mission critical as a, a, for software and applications, but uh, I, I love the, the product that we're building today. Yeah, I mean, especially in the current climate, you know, you have this incre increased cloud activity. You know, organizations are always looking for ways to ensure visibility into the health of their systems and their services. But it's challenging because there's not always a one solution fits all. A lot of times they try exactly. to figure out things in testing and, you know, that kind of thing. But once it gets to production, you know, <laughs> everything is all hands on deck here, I think you could say. You know, maybe, yeah. maybe can you can you take us through some of the challenges you're seeing some of the organizations are doing uh, and what they're, what organizations are doing without such a solution as LogDNA today for in production? Oh, absolutely. The, the, the three challenges that creates opportunities for us is challenge number one, there's a vast amount of data that's happening uh, with time and it's only going to get busier. Um, challenge number two, with the evolution of, of DevOps and, and containers and microservices and Kubernetes, this data is super, super fragmented, right? So to be able to pull that information to one environment creates a huge challenge in a meaningful way that you could uh, interact with this information. And the third challenge is one size doesn't fit all anymore. So gone were the days where people you know, thought everything is going to happen in the public cloud, but environments are, are executed in private cloud, um, pri public cloud, on-prem, it's in a multi-cloud uh, format. So you have to be able to anticipate these trends and this growth. And uh, we have that platform that can handle the scale, uh, doesn't matter which environment's from, doesn't matter the source of the data, but also can be deployed in a multi-cloud format. So uh, it's pretty nice to anticipate that curve and, and see it's only gonna get busier with time with digital transformation. Right, right, right. I do want to get into the scale comment you made because the technology you guys are using is great. But I, I mean, one thing I'm seeing is lots of organizations are working, still working on that waterfall model. They're testing in environments, UAT environments. Mm -hmm. uh, they're using system health monitoring to kind of sh ensure the mm -hmm. quality is uh, good for their shipping product. What What is log management technology doing for organizations that these other rings couldn't do? Uh, I think it was very siloed in the past, whereas now you can take that information and anyone can access this data, whether it's you know what your, your engineers, your DevOps, your infra team, or even business use cases that they could tap into this information. Um, I think when we talk about scale uh, earlier, it's like be able to handle ingest, but also store and search this vast amount of data it's to make it relevant, right? You don't wanna wait days to determine what happened. It's like you want this right. in real time as fast as you can. Right, right, right. We talk about volume of data because obviously there's tons. Of, the more people work from home, the more people use the services, mm -hmm. the more data you're going to be getting. Uh, the more you have to kind of ingest that scale, process it, index it, produce, and basically produce insights and analytics on it. What kind mm -hmm. of technology are you using to handle that kind of thing? So we actually, um, you know, at first when we started off, we had Logstash. We came to shot. We evolved to Kafka, and as we started handling our own. Um, scale and our own challenges, we built our own ingest bus that we wow. internally we call it bu Buzzsaw. And you don't, it wasn't a technology looking for a problem. It was like, oh, guys, we have a problem at high scale. And it's nice that we're able to handle that from a ingest perspective so that you could see real time of your logs, of the live tail. And um, on the back end, you know, we're, we're off of Elastic at the moment, and we found ways to optimize that search speed so that time is of the essence. When you're, when you're dealing with terabytes and terabytes a day. Some of our customers are doing 50 terabytes a day. 
And um, it's one thing to search 50 terabytes, but it's another thing to search it at a window of 14 days. So time is of the essence. It's like, how do I find this needle in the haystack quick? And uh, how do I debug this problem before we, before it escalates as well? Right. Makes sense. Now, before we get into some of the things you guys offer, because there's some really great tools, there's amazing user interface I've interacted with before. Um, I do want to get into the competitive talk really quick. Now, you're hitting Absolutely. Off just at, just after your four-year mark, right? And obviously, mm -hmm. companies like Splunk have been doing this for around 15 years. What is right. what is LogDNA doing here that's the differentiator? I think for us is that focus on developers. We want the ability that you're up and running in 10 minutes, right? Um, enterprise legacy companies to think of a, of a holistic, you know, uh, rip and replace approach for the entire enterprise. Whereas we think that, you know, there's, there's a, that department or that one BU business unit that says, I want to, I want to be up and running quick. I want to see visibility can, does it take, you know, 10 minutes to get up? So we're seeing more of um, in our journey to get developer love, get their adoption and slowly land and expanding over time, which is a nice position to be in. So we have the, the developer love from the bottom end, but also we have the enterprise confidence at the top. And you know, um, IBM Watson uses log DNA to to analyze their logs. So it's nice to have that validation, and it's mm -hmm. nice to have that product that can be used for um, for different use cases at different scale. Right, right, right. So you talk about getting started quickly, and obviously a lot of organizations they have tons and tons of data. What what's kind of the let's say you have uh, Padre, the previous host used to give this scenario. Of, let's say you have 10,000 seats, you have lots of users, and you have lots of data coming in. What's the first steps that they do to kind of get started with log DNA? First step is uh, ingestion source. How are we, we going to take in the information? Uh, the, the second step that we think about is uh, so the ingestion source could be a syslog, it could be code library, uh, Kubernetes. Uh, and we try to make that easy. Not only do we want to make the ingestion process easy, but also the migration. I love the fact that in this space, they're accustomed to a solution. And our goal is to ensure that the migration period um, to even train engineers and developers is pretty easy. So our, our natural language processing, you don't have to learn a custom language. So we actually made it pretty intuitive. If you know how to use a search engine and how you search there, you definitely know how to use log DNA. And most importantly, what's what do you want to be alerted on? What, what's what's the real value? And every different team, every different department has different use cases of what they want to see, what they want to be alerted on, and what matters in their world the most, uh, that's most important. So uh, we are, I think, simplest, simplistic doesn't have to mean um, easy. It means it's also simplistic and powerful at the same time. So uh, that's our core focus, how we think about this. And our our, our use case is, is developers and infrastructure to debug and monitor. So that's uh, that's our beachhead at the beginning, and then slowly we expand with time. Now, you know, we've talked a lot about this before, but cyber threats are actually impacting people's lives. Brian, how, how much are they impacting them? Well, in this case... We covered the story about how a hospital in Dusseldorf, Germany, got hit by ransomware, apparently by accident, because the hackers were apparently going after the university and didn't realize they hit the university hospital. Now, we obviously covered this before, but this is going a little deeper. One, the German authorities are investigating the unknown perpetrators on suspicion of negligent homicide. Let me say that again, negligent homicide. So now you hackers out there, um, Germany is going to do negligent homicide because a person died. Now, the reason why the person died apparently is because the ransomware took down services to the point where it affected the emergency services at that particular hospital. And as a result, the ambulance carrying the woman with a life-threatening condition had to reroute to another hospital 20 miles away. Um, she died. That's what makes it negligent homicide. Now, one of the other things that's happening is that, gee, this was, they managed to get through Citrix. Okay, now... I'm not singling out Citrix. They're, it's a great product. All kind, all this virtual desktop interface or virtual app interfaces, I, I, they are different. You know, one you have a full desktop, one you're only exporting the app. 
um, a lot of these systems have the ability to isolate the app, isolate the desktop. And I got a sneaky hunch when we start looking at the um, details on what this attack entailed that there was probably a vulnerability that got missed. Anyway, what I want to do is, one, I want to go and ask Kurt. He's been following this attack. He actually wrote some articles for um, Dark Reading. I want to know if he's gotten any kind of updates. The other thing is I want our tech – tech folks to go to the second URL. <clears throat> the emergency services in the United States, um, there are only, there are very, very strict rules. And um, I did a little bit of poking around. Germany has very similar rules on what conditions will trigger a redirect. And one of them obviously is being able to get to pharmacology Another, because if the um, physicians and nursing staff cannot even open the drug safes because the network is down, that instantly closes all emergency services. Uh, another one is if you can't, you cannot pull um, patient data. That'll also say you cannot admit. So there's a lot of things that can cause this. So I'm going to kind of ask um, Kurt, does he have an update? Uh, have you been able to poke around and find more details on this story? There really aren't a whole lot of updates right now. I know that German authorities are looking for the perpetrators uh, with, with great intensity. Um, this has all the signs of a, a heist gone wrong. Uh, because as, as we've pointed out here on Twyatt, the ransom note wasn't directed to the hospital. It was directed to the university that the hospital is affiliated with. And as soon as authorities contacted the perpetrators through the mechanism they had given to pay the ransom, they immediately sent the decryption key. Unfortunately, in the case of this one woman, it was not in time to keep her from being redirected with fatal consequences. Um, this is, this is a, a terrible situation, although I will say it was almost inevitable because criminals have been targeting healthcare networks and institutions for the last 12 to 18 months because they know how important it is to these organizations that they have access to their data. And they know that rather than taking the time to work on a decryption algorithm, they would much rather just go ahead, pay, get back online, and then clean up afterwards. So I, I don't have a great deal of new news. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing where this ends up, whether this especially is going to be a local German crime, in other words, a German group of hackers that went against the university, uh, or whether it's international. Um, it, that, to me, that's going to be one of the more fascinating aspects of this because that's going to have consequences in terms of how the legal case is developed. So one of the things I want to ask Lou, you know, we've, we've been dancing around for the last couple of decades, uh, moaning and groaning about how we've had snake oil salesmen, shall we say, in our, in our industry, going around doing really poor work, and then other people that do have the talent have to go in and fix it. I can't tell you how many times I've had to do that. Um, the reality is, is there's been lots and lots and lots of conversations, even in Congress, about creating a certification system of some sort. Um, obviously, the financial ramifications would be amazing. Uh, it would be stunning for the industry. Lots of things would actually scream to a halt. Um, so it's a double-edged sword. 
But when we start having things like this happening, um, there are some things that come up. And the, the thing that I want to bring up is auditing standards. There is a um, set of standards for the Department of Defense for any industries working with the Department of Defense on auditing requirements. And they are very strict and have some really wild penalties associated with them. Um, I'm going to ask Lou, what do you think? Is it time for any portion of our industry that has life th life potential um, situations? Is it time for a stronger set of auditing rules and maybe some new laws with stronger penalties associated with them? Lou, what do you think? Absolutely. I think, you know, it, think about it. I mean, the, with privacy and security rules today, they think of HIPAA, right? This kind of revolutionized the healthcare industry and how they how they handled the flow of information. And I think, you know, if you if you think about how ransomware and, and other things that are related to security uh, are impacting organizations like hospitals and other healthcare uh, organizations, um, people not, might not necessarily be stealing the information, but it's still impacting it. So whether, you know, HIPAA or other uh, or other potential acts that kind of require by law uh, for organizations will change. I still think there needs to be change, definitely, because not only will there be, you know, higher fees and higher requirements around that, but that means that organizations won't be able to to operate, um, uh, you know, using technology to to store this data um, without following these rules. So I, I definitely think there needs to be some switch. Uh, or some movement in that direction, uh, because obviously this will continue to happen, and the organizations will continue to to kind of drag their feet when it comes to technology and securing things. So, uh, you know, pushing this a little bit farther, especially from a law perspective, uh, will help them move forward faster, and uh, you know, even maybe even force them to to think about what they're actually what they actually using technology for. Well, folks, that ends the great year of enterprise and IT news. But I do want to say happy holidays, everybody. And also thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to my co-host, starting with our very own Mr. Curtis Franklin. Curtis, happy holidays to you, my friend. And appreciate all the work and all the support you've had over the years. What are you going to be doing over the holidays? Well, Lou, I'm going to be spending a lot of time with, uh, well, with my beautiful wife because we aren't able to be with much wider family, although we do have a, spew, a few special friends we're going to uh, be in our bubble with. Looking forward to that. And uh, with the coming year, I've got some changes to talk about. So uh, we'll tease that just a little bit. Some new stuff that I'll be able to talk about when we're back in 2021. Well, speaking of busy, we also have our very own geek in paradise, Mr. Brian Chi. Chi Bird, happy holidays. What's keeping you busy during the holiday season? Yes, I'm actually... Leaving the beautiful state of Hawaii, which I've been here all my life, I'm moving literally to the other end of the country into the sunshine state of Florida. But you know what? <clears throat> if you want to drop me a line, my Twitter handle is ADVNETLAB, Advanced Net Lab. But you're also welcome to drop me a line at Chebert at twit.tv or Twiat at twit.tv. And Twilight at twit.tv will hit all the hosts. Would love to hear from you and happy new year to everybody. Well, remember, you can always subscribe at twit.tv slash twilight. There you'll find all of our amazing back episodes, our show notes, our guest information. And more importantly, next to the videos there, you'll get your helpful subscribe and download links as well. Get your enterprise and IT news by subscribing to the Twilight podcast. Happy holidays to everybody. And thanks for watching. And thanks for a great year. I'm Lewis from Rusko, just reminding you, if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep Twilight.